Hey, I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. Welcome to Essential Issues Weekly, where I talk about DC Comics one week after their release on the DC Universe, uh, the Ultra Tier, excuse me, of the DC Universe Infinite subscription service. In each installment, I pick an assortment of comics to talk about as a DC fan and also explore what, if anything, they have to say about the essential issues of real life. Now, warning, full spoilers for everything I talk about. This is your first and only warning that many spoilers lie ahead. Right now, we're look looking at comics originally released to the Ultra Tier, February 13th, 2024, originally published January 16th, 2024. And first from that group is Wonder Woman number five. I have really been enjoying this run by Tom King. And in this issue, Wonder Woman realizes that pretty soon it's going to be her versus the U.S. government. It's going to be a big old mess. And she wanted, she tries to ensure in this issue that those closest to her do not get caught up in the mess along with her. She's trying to protect them from that. And so she visits uh, several key members of her supporting cast and goes through these sort of contests with them, slightly reminiscent of the contests that she went through to represent Themyscira to the world, um, to, but to determine in each of these interactions whether or not uh, her, her companions, her friends, will uh, agree to stay out of this. If she, if Diana wins the contest, they stay out. If they win, then Diana has to allow them to get into the thick of things with her. I think it, it functions as this really nice kind of reintroduction or just kind of touching base with Diana's supporting cast, not necessarily to re-familiarize uh, us with them, but to freshen up in our minds her relationship with each of these women, including uh, Cassandra Sandsmark, I think is her name, um, who's the current... Well, is she the current Wonder Girl? I can't remember. Anyway, there's a new Wonder Girl. And I have I can't even remember what her name is. I just read the issue. Uh, and then Donna Troy. So these are the three like kind of uh, uh, pseudo sidekicks, I guess, that she's had over the years. But it's a, it's a neat way to have her interacting with these characters who she loves very deeply, and yet they're kind of in conflict with. And so it reminds us of sort of uh, Diana's power levels compared to her supporting cast, and really establishes her as as the, as the top of the heap in terms of superheroes coming out of. Uh, Themyscira lore. But at the same time, even while creating that conflict, it reminds us constantly of her love for these women and their love for her. Uh, something that's continuing in Tom King's run that I find interesting and appealing and yet increasingly, uh, I think, incompatible with how Wonder Woman has been written is her, um, her command of the English language. The way her dialogue is written in Tom King's run makes her makes it sound like english is not her first language and really leaning into that to the point where i'm like well there's there's a in, uh, a part of this issue here where she's talking to uh cass and she says i was not born as you were my english is not always so perfect um i have never understood this almost you know and so the the, the i mean i don't want to get in the weeds of that conversation but to this at this point they're really leaning into this and i i love it because I think it makes her stand out from other characters in the DC universe. Just culturally, she's a little bit more of a fish out of water. I love all that kind of stuff. And yet, I'm like, um, I could point you to, I mean, I don't know how many comics just in the last five years alone, where she has perfect command of the English language and sometimes really seems fairly Americanized, you know. Uh, so, you know, I just kind of have to shrug, I guess. That's comic books for you. Moving on, though, to Jay Garrick, The Flash, number four. This is probably the comic that I most enjoyed reading as a fan this week. It's really digging into Jay Garrick's past, even though some of it's being retconned, of course, to introduce his daughter Joan. But we're also introduced to like a retreatment of Jay Garrick's origin in this issue. Of course, uh, famously among DC fans, he was exposed to hard water fumes and from that gained the powers of super speed. And of course, during the Wally West, Mark Wade era, uh, th that was just a, kind of described as uh, like a, a catalyst for the speed force to really make a connection with Jay Garrick. It's really all about the speed force, yada, yada, yada. But they lean back into the science of Jay Garrick origin, but also recontextualize what we're talking about in, in terms of this hard water business. Now, the whole hard water thing has been made fun of before. In fact, I don't remember where, but I think there was a comic where somebody was like, hard water, isn't that just ice, you know? <laughs> um, and 
the way I'm used to hearing the term hard water is when it's there's a high there's high mineral content um, in the, the your drinking water or the water that you shower with or whatever. And so the way they're using it here, I'm like, boy, they're really leaning into hard water. Is is this becoming its own thing in the pseudoscience of the DC universe where they are talking about something that's different from just water with a lot of minerals in it or what? Um, but they surround it uh, with other details that make the hard water aspect far less material to uh, Jay Garrick's origin of his powers. What we learn in this issue is that a scientist who was uh, trying to develop uh, the ability to make humans super powered in light of 1938's Green Lantern coming on the scene, um, he uses Jay Garrick as an unwitting human a trial for some experiments that he's working on and actually orchestrates the quote unquote accident that resulted in Jay Garrick absorbing these hard water fumes. And there's a bunch of other elements going on. It's not just hard water fumes. That was the catalyst and kind of like the main, the, the vehicle for the stuff to get into Jay's lungs. But there's a bunch of other pseudoscience going on. And I appreciate them revisiting and just complicating his origin just a little bit more. But even so, the way they're using the term hard, hard water is a little bit funny. But what I appreciate maybe even more than them kind of like retracing the pseudoscience of his origin is bringing this this scientist who I think becomes eventually the villain Mr. Element, uh, some, something element, I think. And I was like, wow, has that name really not been taken yet? <laughs> because he's a new villain that is part of Jay Garrick's, you know, now retconned past. Um, and so this arch nemesis, I guess, maybe of Jay Garrick's is, was instrumental, was actually the cause of not only Jay gaining his powers, but we learn for his daughter, oh, not Joan, Judy, sorry, his daughter Judy as well, uh, because he's trying to replicate uh, what the, the fluke that happened with Jay, understand it better so that ultimately he can create the same effects in a normal human because he proposes that uh, what actually happened here was he... Uh, activated Jay Garrick's metahuman gene, that all the other experiments and human trials failed because they didn't have the metagene, and Jay Garrick did. And so he tested that by testing it on his daughter, and then he next sets his sights on someone that does not have the metagene to see if, based on what he's learned, he can create the same effects now in someone who does not have the metagene. And specifically, we see that way back when he set his sights on Joan Garrick. Sorry, Joan is, is Jay's wife. So I was getting <laughs> Joan, Judy, Jay. <laughs> anyway, all that to say, although it's not confirmed in this issue, I'm wondering if what we're going to learn is Mr. Element did some kind of an experiment on Joan unbeknownst to her that did not give her super speed, but does uh, explain why she has not aged any more than Jay has. Now, there's been different things over the years that they've used to explain, you know, why Jay has not, and Joan, have not died of old age, um, you know, because they've been around since, like, you know, 1938. And uh, there have been different things, magic and time travel -y stuff and being caught in limbo and various things like that to explain why they haven't, you know, aged themselves into oblivion by this point. Um, but with several resets and continuity crises of the DC universe, it's hard to know which ones they're thinking are still in play as explanations for why Jay and Joan, you know, are, are not really old and decrepit and just in wheelchair, wheelchairs on life support at this point. Um, and so it looks like maybe, especially since they mention in this issue that Jay Garrick's powers also are keeping him young, then of course that leads to the question, well, what about Joan? So I'm wondering if what we'll learn in this kind of retracing, this re slight rebooting of Jay Garrick's origin, that Joan has not aged because the the experiment on her was only partially successful. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, that would kind of like wrap things up in a bow as far as their age goes quite uh, nicely for my taste. But either way, I'm really enjoying this exploration of Jay making he and Joan parents um, for a daughter that they love. And even though they're sorting through some things there, Jeremy Adams, I mean, really showed in the pages of his Wally West flash run that he does a great job writing families. And now I'm, you know, I'm also really enjoying his run in Green Lantern. Um, I think The Flash 
is where I'm really seeing his strengths, especially. But either way, it's just kind of neat. Jeremy Adams is a relatively new writer to me, but I'm enjoying his run on basically my two favorite characters in DC Comics, the Green Lantern and the Flash. So uh, really looking forward to the next issue. I mean, I get through these issues really fast and I'm always wanting more. Next up is a Green Lantern War Journal number five, starring Jon Stewart. And I have been enjoying this run um, but th I do have some mixed feelings about it. As far as like the main plot of what John is doing, the evils he's combating, it's getting a little bit too multiverse hoppy and just kind of like, I, I don't know, a little bit so far out there that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting numb to the stakes. I mean, when characters are talking about, okay, well, let's go save your universe. Well, let's go save your universe. <laughs> When you start throwing around phrases like that, I start becoming numb to the stakes. And so actually the main story is not pulling me in much. I mean, it's got some good action and stuff, but it's the side story dealing with Jon Stewart and his mother that gets me coming back to this, uh, this run again and again. In case you don't remember, his uh, mother um, is suffering from Alzheimer's or some form of dementia and believes that... Uh, John's younger sister Ellie is still alive when she actually passed away years ago and a number of times John has had to explain it to, to her that Ellie has passed away and then he has to deal with her being shattered by that over and over and over again and so you know he's gone back and forth different times from just like kind of going along with her delusions so that he doesn't have to see her go through that again and other times trying to explain it to her and get her caught up i mean it's such a, a terrible dilemma that he's in that um is sadly all too real for uh, many people in the world who are dealing with uh, dementia in their loved ones and so um i, I just appreciate just how grounded the stakes are emotionally for john when it comes to this a subplot with his mom. In fact, arguably the most dramatic moment that also has to do with the limits of Jon Stewart's power uh, are really center on this emotional story. I mean, he's he says earlier in the issue that a Green Lantern can do anything. Um, but then it's not in some big cosmic battle where he brings that conviction to bear, but it's with his mom and realizing he needs to leave and go on this mission, leave her behind, and her dementia has gotten worse how is he going to care for her? And looking at an old old photo of his mom and his sister and them together, he says a Green Lantern can do anything. He says that three times. Um, and then summons a ring construct that is completely full color. Now, this is something that's been explored a little bit more. We've seen this in the pages of the main Green Lantern book that Jeremy Adams is reading. I'm not sure how I feel about it. Um, I think as a limitation, being you know only being able to create green constructs um, is fitting. So I'm at least glad, even though I'm not sure if I'm okay with this, I'm at least glad that they made what he's creating here in this color construct um, apparently a great act of will, like a very intense act of his will that he had to summon a lot to make happen. Although it may not just be that it's a, it's a uh, in-color facsimile of his departed sister uh, Ellie, but also that he has him imbued her with something of himself, his heart, his memories uh, of his sister, his love for his mom, the idea being that he's leaving this facsimile of his uh, dead sister behind to care for uh, his mother while he is away and know that because he has imbued this thing with his own love in some sense we don't really know exactly how that works um, I don't believe this is a, a living thing or that we're supposed to see this as a living thing but rather a really complex program that is meant to simulate the loving choices that John would make were he to stay behind with with his mother and also uh, uh, simulate what he remembers of his sister Ellie so uh, it's an interesting choice it'll be interesting to see where they go with it but it's a nice touching moment, very grounded, um, before John goes off and becomes very ungrounded to save the multiverse or whatever the crap he's up to. Finally, we have Batman Superman World's Finest number 23, part four of the return to Kingdom Come storyline that is exploring uh, the origin of Gog, the main kind of like antagonist featured in the classic Kingdom Come story. As someone who's not particularly a fan of that classic Mark Wade story, uh, I've not been super interested in this, although the writing moment to moment, I think is, uh, I'm 
I'm, I'm doing okay with. I find it pretty solid. Uh, I'm ready to get past this story arc, but I'm still curious enough to continue following it. But really what got my attention in this issue, far more than my engagement with it as a, as a DC nerd, was a particular um, exchange between... Well, let me get to it here. Batman is in the midst of fighting David, or Gog, uh, or maybe it's no Magog is his name. I think Gog is the guy that created him and Magog is the, the villain from Kingdom Come. Anyway, so David is his, is his regular, you know, human name. He's trying to reason with David to come away from, you know, all that he's got caught up in and this kind of villain that he's becoming. And he says, David, Superman thought of you as a son. Stop wallowing in self-pity and remember what did he tell you over and over again? That no matter what mistakes you might make, he believes in you that you're worthy of his respect just by being who you are. That at heart, you're a good person and you deserve the chance to be a great hero. Now, admittedly, I've not been like really focused in on this story well enough to uh, kind of give some thoughts on this particular situation and whether or not what Batman is saying about him is true. But I do find this language to be representative of, of the kind of language that's used today when uh, people are talking about the nature of each of us as humans and the kinds of things that from a secular or a pop philosophy standpoint, um, people like to think of themselves and will kind of tell to say to each other as well. First, he says, no matter what mistakes you might make, uh, I think sometimes we use the word mistakes when really what someone has done is they've sinned. They have done wrong. Um, but we don't call it that. Those words are too harsh. And uh, largely, I think we have trouble thinking of what we've done as wrong or sin um, when we don't see a means of forgiving uh, and, and reconciling that, you know. Um, I think Christians are more comfortable talking about having sinned ourselves or having wronged ourselves, or at least we should be, because we are relying on the the grace, the forgiveness, the payment for our sins afforded to us uh, by Jesus. But in the absence of that, I think the tendency is to reduce the severity of our uh, of our sin and our wrongs to a word like mistake, which sounds a little bit like an, an accident, like an oopsie-daisy, didn't do it on purpose, not really my fault, you know. Uh, but a lot of things that we label in ourselves as mistakes uh, are actually sin, and they're actually wrongdoing. And uh, as Christians, we should be first in line to, to, to not use that language of ourselves and say, I made a mistake, but to say, you know what, what I did was wrong, and what I did was a sin. Can you please forgive me for that? The next thing Batman says is, you're worthy of his respect just by being who you are. Now, I'm not sure what Batman means by this. Depending on what he means, I could either agree or disagree with this as, a, as something that could be said of anyone. Um, if what he means by being who you are has to do with behavior, actions, a certain consistency of actions, um, then I think people are worthy of various degrees of respect based on that, you know. Um, but if what he's saying here is you're worthy of respect, you know, no matter what, the, the, and like that who you are is a person. And so as a person, you are worthy of respect. I can get on board with that. And I think as Christians, we especially have grounding for that because all people are created in God's image and are imbued with immense value because of not only that, but because of the fact that he offered up himself uh, to pay for the sins of all the world so that we could be with him forever. I mean, like that... <laughs> That's stunning the more that I meditate on that and really contemplate the ramifications of that. If that doesn't speak to the immense value of every human being, uh, I don't know what does. Um, I don't think philosophically that in particular is <laughs> what Batman has in mind. Um, but I mean, that's where I would go if I were to try and frame this in a way that I that I would agree with, that of the idea of a person, any person, being worthy of respect, no matter what they've done, because they are an image bearer of God. I can get on board with that. Now, respect is an approval. That doesn't mean we're going to approve of everything that someone does or says or thinks because they're an image bearer. But 
granting them respect and dignity and value by nature of them being made in the image of God, loved by God, is something that we should be about as Christians, no matter who it is that we're, we're talking to or thinking about. Then finally, um, this is almost like <laughs> advertisement language. He says, at heart, you're a good person. Well, what does that even mean? <laughs> That's, that is such a vague, nebulous term. I don't even know what that means. You're a good person, and you deserve the chance to be a great hero. A lot of this kind of deserving language, that sounds like an ad campaign. You deserve a break today. You deserve this. You deserve that. I'm like, uh, do you even know me? <laughs> what are you talking about? I How can you say that? How can you say that I deserve, you know, to get f f $5 off of my meal at Denny's or... <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> in this case, does David deserve the chance to be a great hero? Maybe. I don't really remember the details. I think he made some really bad choices. Um, some things he did because he was influenced to do, so there's that to, to take into consideration as well. But I do just tend to notice this kind of entitlement language, this deserve type of uh, language that finds its way into writing and into our thoughts of ourselves. And I think we do need to be on guard against applying too much of that deserve entitlement language um, to ourselves. Anyway, uh, my ring choice for this week is the orange ring of avarice or greed, because I am greedy for more. I, especially when it comes to, let's see, what were the ones that are Wonder Woman and The Flash and J. J. Garrick The Flash, and to some degree Green Lantern War Journal. I feel like I'm just in a nice groove, the middle of these story arcs, I'm like, I am definitely digging what you're doing, and I just can't wait for the next issue. That's how I feel in particular about Wonder Woman and Jay Garrick the Flash. So, uh, having a good time with uh, at least two to three books this week and, and anxious for more. But those are all of my thoughts on comic books for now. What's got your attention in uh, the comic books I talked about today? Or maybe some comic that came out uh, to the Ultras here last week that I haven't mentioned. Uh, as always, I'd love to get your thoughts uh, in the comments below. Remember to check out ChristianGeekCentral.com for tons more content. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. For more chat about geek entertainment, answers to your questions, and news from the wider world of Christian geekery, get the Christian Geek Central podcast today on iTunes and other podcast services.